morning. It is uh, a pleasure and an honor to welcome you this morning here on behalf of the, of the rector, Professor Mattelli. Uh, after having uh, celebrated uh, the opening of the academic year early this week, uh, we continue the celebration of the 800 year anniversary of, your, of our university, which uh, is a place of uh, uh, study of science of culture over the centuries. In particular, our motto uh, speaks about freedom. Freedom of science, of talk, of uh, movement of people, people who came over the centuries to Padua to continue their studies and to uh, develop their science, like Galileo Galilei, whose podium is just in the hall behind us. Freedom also of enterprise based on scientific discoveries. And uh, our uh, lecturer today, Professor Rossi, will also talk about this. Derek is uh, a bright and brilliant scientist who had the pleasure to meet and to work with when I was in Boston. He will talk to you about uh, his research in stem cell science and about perspective for the development of future treatment for patients based on scientific discoveries. So it is a pleasure for me to welcome him and to welcome Professor Cimetta to give a proper introduction about Derek's work. Thank you and have a great lecture. Okay. So I usually am not that nervous when I give either a speech or an introduction, but today I am. And I think it's a lot of things together. So being in this majestic room, I mean, it's amazing, right? And uh, seeing people after such a long time when we've all been stuck in front of a computer. So this is nice. I cannot get to see all your either smiles, frowns, or whatever, but we'll get there soon. So it is truly, truly a pleasure to be here and to have Professor Rossi with us. And uh, as you know, and as Professor Biffy said, we are celebrating our 800th birthday. I mean, that's a milestone. And I think that another amazing motto that the university came up with now is, okay, I'm 800 years old, but I'm still learning. Sto ancora imparando. And it's actually what we do as scientists. Like, there's so much stuff out there that we do not know yet. So with, with research that Professor Rossi, Professor Biffi, and many, many other people, I mean, we see Professor Ristuto here as well. That's what we do. We strive to learn more, even from our mistakes. So there's so much out there that we still need to understand. And what we do, like for example, I come from the industrial engineering department. So we're like, there's a lot of disciplines. We have chemical engineers like myself and many other people that I see in the audience, Professor Bezzo from my department is here. We have chemical engineers, material engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical, all together working closely with scientists from other disciplines. Biomedical, uh, sorry, biomedical engineering, of course, biology, doctors, chemists, all combining our shared knowledge, striving to get closer and closer to cures for our diseases, but even to provide tools for easier, better life, like everyday life. So I think that in this scenario, having Professor Rossi here is the perfect opportunity for us all to learn mo more about his research. And let me actually pull up his bio that is quite, quite long and interesting. But basically, Professor Rossi graduated from the University of Toronto. He had quite an eventful journey. I hope he will say something about it. So he got his PhD from the University of Helsinki in Finland, and then he moved back to the States. He became professor at Harvard, and uh, his discoveries were named like between the top 100 most influential discoveries. Uh, I think that was 2010, right? And let me see, in 2010, uh, he got also nominated, yes, the top 10 breakthroughs. His uh, technique of modified mRNA, which is the core of the technology that he will also describe today. But then one of his passions became translating his discoveries, like what he'd been studying for years and years and years, closer 
to the final end user, which is us. So he became a serial entrepreneur. So he co-founded and funded several biotechs. And after retiring from academia, when he decided it was time to devote full time to, to this uh, kind of passion, so translating science into actual products and companies, um, he, I think that since then, he also had time to find other side projects and passions. We, I mean, I might ask you about that later, so everybody will know. But basically, so he, of course, founded Moderna in 2010. So we, I think that we, all of us heard about it in the past couple of years, but the company has been out there for a long time and working on several, several disruptive technologies that you'll hear about. Um, he also uh, funded companies developing CRISPR-Cas9-based um, uh, therapeutics and uh, many, many more. So I hope that you are as excited as I am to welcome Professor Rossi on stage. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the lecture. Okay. Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. What a haul. Very sharp. Uh, I'm just going to ask my translator if she can hear me. You good? Uh, and, oh, we're kind of advanced quite far into my talk already, so I'll just start from there. Oh, there we go. Uh, so today I'm going to uh, talk about um, uh, some work that we did in the lab that eventually translated uh, through the um, uh, startup biotech process into uh, therapies that are uh, either treating patients or are still currently in development. I'm going to tell you about three separate stories um, uh, in that regard, one of which we've is, uh, sort of uh, reached the global stage with mRNA uh, therapeutics, so I'll start with that one because it's Quite, quite an exciting story. So let me see if I can advance these. Here we go. So <clears throat> the story starts uh, in a really uh, uh, strange place for mRNA therapeutics. It starts with stem cell science uh, and with this gentleman here, which all the scientists in the room know is uh, Shinye Amanaka, who made this really breathtaking discovery uh, in 2006 that uh, he could express after screening 24 different transcription factors, but he found that expression of four of them could convert any cell type back through developmental time to something known as a pluripotent stem cell, so an embryonic stem cell-like cell. -like cell. Uh, and um, I would just say that, you know, had he presented uh, this idea to a scientific body, let's say, to get money, and uh, the meeting was held on the fifth floor, the scientists in the room would have picked him up and thrown him out the window because it was such an outlandish idea because we had believed that cell identity was fixed, uh, but he uh, taught us that it's actually not fixed. You could rewrite the epigenetic code of a cell and convert it back to a pluripotent state. So it was a breathtaking discovery. So this was in 2006. And I remember um, seeing his lecture prior to publication at a meeting in Toronto. And I was sitting and I was just thinking, wow, very breathtaking. So if you have not read that study, you should, because it's really extraordinary. Anyhow, his discovery was these four transcription factors were the key. And they're now called Yamanaka factors, which is appropriate. And, uh, of course, he will wins the Nobel Prize in medicine, not surprisingly. So this is where uh, mRNA therapeutics starts for my lab, because we were working on stem cell biology. So I started my lab uh, at Harvard a year after Yamanaka's discovery, so in 2007. Uh, whoops. And we had this very simple idea. So at the time when Yamanaka had made his discovery, he used retroviruses 
we're going to talk about viruses a lot today, but he used retroviruses to deliver the cargo, these transcription factors, to cells. Biologists utilize nature all the time, and, and viruses are perfect little delivery vehicles. That's basically what the, what the idea was. But it was not going to be uh, therapeutically translational. So at the time, the whole scientific world, certainly the stem cell world, was thinking, well, how do we do achieve Yamanaka's feet without using these potentially dangerous delivery vehicles, these retroviruses? So we had a very simple idea. I was trained in molecular biology, and I know that DNA makes mRNA, makes protein, makes biology, makes life. Uh, and so we thought, well, mRNA is a transient molecule. Why don't we just use mRNA for this process? It's a transient, it's a relatively labile molecule. Um, uh, and it is, would not integrate into the DNA because DNA makes mRNA, but it doesn't go the other way. So it's a very simple idea. But isn't it strange, though, that uh, RNA was discovered to be this intermediate, obligate intermediate between DNA and protein synthesis? That had been discovered in the early 1960s, yet in the intervening decades, molecular biologists were not using mRNA to express their favorite proteins of interest. Now, trust me, if they could have, they would have, because molecular biologists borrow from nature all the time. But we just sort of <laughs> discounted that idea, and we thought, well, let's try. So we made a very lovely textbook RNA with all the bells and whistles, five prime regulatory sequences, three prime regulatory sequences, a middle coding sequence, uh, and we put it into cells, and it totally didn't work. Uh, and it didn't work in spectacular fashion, uh, and hence why the many decades passed and nobody was using mRNA. You see, um, mRNA is normally made within the cell, within the nucleus. It's encoded from the DNA, and it's exported from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. It goes to the ribosome, and this is where protein is made. What we were doing was bringing mRNA from inside, or from outside the cell into the cell. And that was really the problem, because nucleic acid coming in from outside the cell, what does it look like? Viruses. So basically, ever since cells and viruses first met one another, viruses have been trying to figure out how to get their nucleic acid into cells, and cells have been coming up with new and uh, clever pathways to fight that. So what we were doing when we were introducing mRNA into the cells, because we were you know, putting it on human fibroblasts in culture, uh, introducing it from the outside, is we were tripping these very ancient antiviral pathways. And I'm sure, by the way, that many dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of labs over the decades have tried to do this and met the same fate that we did, which was tripping these pathways, which, if the cell is smart, how does it respond to a viral infection? It kills itself. You know, it's, it's an altruistic suicide. Better to kill oneself than to uh, allow oneself to be a vector for viral propagation. So this uh, very busy slide here, which I'm going to take you through in excruciating detail, no, just kidding, uh, is basically these antiviral pathways that we, were, that we were eliciting. Let me see if the laser works. No, laser doesn't work. So uh, outside the cell is at the top, viruses of various sorts, single-stranded RNA, double-stranded RNA, DNA, they come in to the cell and they activate these ancient antiviral pathways. RIG-I mediated, TLR mediated, NF-kappa B mediated. Uh, and the cellular response, if it's a robust infection, is altruistic suicide, apoptosis. So we were killing cells in the dish. Like I said, it didn't work in spectacular fashion. Put RNA out of the cells, watch all the cells die. So that could have been the end of the story. And as I said, I suspect that labs over the years had tried this, killed their cells, and said, oh, we don't know why that's not going to work. Let's do something else. But we thought maybe there's a workaround. So uh, turns out that um, the building blocks of RNA are actually heavily modified in our bodies. 
So there's actually over 110 known uh, uh, RNA nucleoside modifications. Uh, and lucky for us, um, two years previous to our start of this project, there had been a paper published by uh, Catalan Carrico and Drew Weissman in uh, Immunity, which is a great uh, journal, where they had discovered that certain modified nucleosides, and they were not making mRNAs, they were just using short little, they were studying why is RNA rejected from cells. So they were using little short oligonucleotides of RNA, but they had found that if they put on certain modifications, which are naturally occurring, you could actually get the RNA, these oligos, into the cell without tripping these antiviral pathways. So we thought, well, maybe we can use those nucleosides in mRNA to get now coding mRNA into the cell without activating these pathways which were killing all our cells. So some of the modifications that, that Carrico and Weissman discovered were, for example, uridine, which exists in the cell. We have lots of pseudouridine in our bodies. We also have uridine. Uh, but that was one that they had discovered was good at abrogating the antiviral response. And so this is, by the way, a Nobel winning discovery. So, spoiler alert, Carrico and Weissman will win the Nobel Prize for this discovery because it really does enable the whole field. Um, we took it a step farther, but this is really the fundamental discovery. So, <clears throat> I'll show you a couple of experiments. So, uh, first uh, mRNA that we encoded was a nice little test mRNA for green fluorescent protein. It's a jellyfish protein. It's nice. You put it into the cell. If you get the green flu fluorescent protein made, you, your cells glow green under a certain wavelength of light, which you can see. Uh, so when we made textbook mRNA, we got some green cells in the dish. I don't have a laser, but you know, this is very low magnification, but you know, those green dots are actually cells. But what you see on the right, which I can't point to, uh, on the bottom right is the viability. Even after one injection of the GFP mRNA, we were killing a lot of cells. Uh, however, when we synthesized the mRNA now with one of these modifications, 5-methylcytidine in, in place of cytidine, now you can see we have a lot more green cells on the, uh, on, that were alive and happy, and you can see that the viability on the lower right is better. Similarly, when we used, uh, synthesized the mRNA with pseudouridine in place of uridine, again, we got a lot of green cells and viable cells, but really the, the breakthrough came when we combined them because, of course, they're on different nucleosides, so we made RNA with 5-methylcytidine and pseudouridine in complete substitution of cytidine and uridine. And now we had, you know, plates full of very happily uh, vibrant, viable cells that were blasting expression of GFP. So we called this modified RNA, and then we shortened it to mod RNA, and everybody in my lab started to express all of their favorite proteins with this technology because we had a new cool technology and of course why wouldn't you try to exploit it? So it had some really lovely properties actually. So for example on the left this is a, a fax plot where on the, uh, the leftmost there's no expression of GFP and as you move rightward you get increased expression of this jellyfish protein and so basically what this shows is that the more modified RNA you added the greater the intensity of the signal. So, in other words, it was dose titratable. Very important for a medicine to be dose titratable. So we had control over dose. If we wanted a small amount expressed, we put in a little bit of modified RNA. If we wanted more expressed, we would put more. It's a very nice property. But uh, I told you uh, at the start that mRNA is a labile molecule. It's degraded quite quickly. And so this is a time course of um, expression with GFP. So time is on the x-axis and the uh, sort of intensity of expression is on the uh, uh, y-axis. So you can see that you introduce the mRNA, the modified mRNA, you got a peak of expression at about 12, 15 hours, but then it diminished over the next couple of days. So this is a function of two things, of course. 
the half-life of the RNA, but also when we were talking about this yesterday, the half-life of the protein. <clears throat> but what we found, and this was really critical to our goals, was that we could repeat transfect. So we could just, again, once the expression diminished, we could add more a, a modified mRNA and get more expression and do it again and again and again and again. And this you would never be able to do with uh, unmodified mRNA because unmodified mRNA, you kill 80% of the cells the first time you put it on and you absolutely kill all the rest the second time you put it on. So you have a total blank uh, plate, like not a single cell alive. But here's an experiment with human fibroblasts that after 10 days of consecutive expression, you can see we have a plate full of cells and they're expressing, which in this case was a nuclear GFP. Another nice property, you could co-express uh, proteins. So we could just, when we added the mRNA to the cells, we could just uh, incorporate as many as we wished and the cells would express all of the proteins that we were introducing. So in this experiment, it's just two. We put a modified mRNA for m cherry or GFP, and you could see that all the cells were expressing both proteins. And we went up to eight proteins, but I know experiments now that have gone up to 20 proteins or 20 different modified mRNAs. Actually, an experiment that I, I really wanted somebody in my lab to do, and, but they, I could never convince anybody to do it. So if, if there are any young scientists here and they want a really cool idea, I'll, I'll give it to you. Um, take a cell that absolutely doesn't have any components of a single signaling pathway, introduce all the mRNAs for the entire signaling pathway, and activate the entire signaling pathway, from cell surface receptors to intermediate cellular transmitters down to transcription factors. I just thought it'd be a lovely, lovely experiment. Couldn't get anybody to, to do it. So we went back to the task at hand, which was to move cell fate around. So the first cell fate that we moved was we took human fibroblasts, and actually the first transcription factor discovered to be able to reprogram cells to a different fate was this uh, transcription factor called MyOD, which is a canonical myogenic transcription factor. So we made a modified mRNA for MyOD, introduced it in fibroblast, and turned the cells into multinucleate contractile muscle cells. We, of course, then went and did the Yamanaka reprogramming as I, I uh, uh, introduced at the beginning. So Yamanaka's experiment is on the top there. You remember he used retroviruses. Those are the transcription factors, KLF, uh, MYC, OC4, uh, SOX. Uh, but when we did it with mRNA, it was orders of magnitude more efficient. So this was a nice surprise. We weren't expecting that, but essentially, if we got the transcription factors into the cells, they reprogrammed. So each of those brown dots is a different pluripotent stem cell colony. And then we did an experiment which I thought was really cool, but which kind of got overlooked, which I thought was strange. But we took human fibroblasts, we used the modified mRNA to turn them into pluripotent stem cells, and then we used a different modified mRNA and turned those cells into muscle cells. So reverse, first from fibroblast to pluripotent stem cell and then take it to another fate. So you can imagine the, the, the promise of iPS cells is you take a skin cell off somebody, you turn it back into a pluripotent stem cell, and then if they therapeutically need a lung cell or a liver cell or a, you know, whatever cell, muscle cell, you could now use the same cool technology to direct fate that way. Like I said, we did this experiment in our paper and it didn't get much attention. It surprised me, because it's a really nice experiment. So anyhow, we published the paper in 2010. We got the cover of uh, Cell Stem Cell. I had an artist um, sort of uh, uh, did a design for the cover with uh, the uh, Greek god here uh, carrying the mRNA staff with the map of cell fate in his hand. Uh, and we also got a lot of press. The lay press got very excited by this. The, you know, it was in, in newspapers around the planet, which was quite nice. But it's interesting. I started to get calls from pharmaceutical companies. And every call I answered, they were like, hey, Dr. Rossi, we'd really like to use your reprogramming technology because we're really in, interested in these iPS cells. And I got like five calls from big heads of R&D at pharma, 
And I, as I'm on the phone, I'm thinking, wait a sec, don't these guys see what the real potential is here? The real potential is to be able to express any protein you wish to express. Who cares about modifying cell fate, even though we had, of course, just published a paper on that. But the real power of this is now to be able to express any, any protein that you wish to express in any cell. And we had demonstrated that in many, many different cell types, which I, I don't show you. So, but we had done all our work in vitro, all in cells in a dish. And obviously, I was thinking therapeutic translation into people. <laughs> so we had to have some evidence that we could take this technology, put it into live animals, and have expression. So we did a few small experiments to demonstrate that. So uh, the first one we did was, uh, again, we encoded, scientists love to borrow from nature. Uh, we used a, a, an mRNA encoding a protein from firefly. So the firefly is this uh, little insect that in the night sky of the forest, you know, lights up, these flashes of light. Uh, so it does that with an enzyme called luciferase. It acts on a substrate called, whoops, luciferin. And so we encoded luciferase, this firefly uh, protein, onto mRNA, and we injected it into the thigh muscle of mice, and then we gave them the substrate. And by the time we transferred the mice from injection on the table into the dark chamber with, you know, very sensitive, light-sensitive camera, uh, they were expressing this protein in their thigh where we had injected them. So you could see uh, dose titration, and again, we talked about this earlier, but it's dose titratable on the x-axis and time on the y-axis. So we got very, um, er and actually even earlier, literally within hours we had expression in the, uh, in the thigh muscle of the leg. But again, by four or five days later, the expression had diminished. Well, um, luciferase is not a therapeutic protein, so I wanted to do an exper experiment with a ther therapeutic protein. So we did a simple one. I'm a blood biologist, so we, I know that erythropoietin uh, is, uh, stimulates red blood cell production. It's a growth factor for red blood cells. Uh, and human erythropoietin is different from mouse erythropoietin in a couple of amino acids for which there was an antibody. So we could actually put in human erythropoietin into mice and measure human erythropoietin, not mouse erythropoietin. And so just, I'm sure many of you know that erythropoietin is the drug, the growth factor that the cyclists dope on because, you know, you take erythropoietin, you get increased red cell production, it allows you to cycle longer and faster up a hill. We weren't trying to make the mice cycle faster, <laughs> but we did want to uh, measure whether or not we could get human erythropoietin made. So we injected them into the thigh with a modified mRNA for erythropoietin, and then when we looked in the blood, we could measure human erythropoietin in a dose-dependent manner, and then when we measured their blood, we could see dose-dependent increase in red blood cell production, which is what you would expect from being dosed with erythropoietin. So this gives us some evidence that we could do a human therapeutic protein and have it work. And the remarkable thing about this technology, this is the first experiment we did in vivo. The, sorry, luciferase was the first experiment. This is like the third experiment. So we got it to work in vivo very easily. And you know you have something robust when it doesn't take you three or four years to get it to work in vivo. We got it to work, and we were not in vivo del delivery experts. We just went down to the animal colony with a syringe full of modified mRNA, stuck it into the thigh muscle of the, m the mice, and, and got this technology to work. So quite robust. That was very exciting. So this is an experiment a little bit more sophisticated where we introduced modified mRNA into the murine heart, and then we did a, 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 a myocardial infarction model. We tie off the, the heart. Um, I won't, just in the interest of time, I won't talk through all the details, but on the right you could see blue expression that was basically the mRNA. We talked about this experiment yesterday in your office. Um, that's just one injection, and we could get all that uh, cardiac muscle expressed. Uh, 
there's that picture that I drew on your, <laughs> drew on your uh, board uh, yesterday afternoon. Uh, so really one injection, you got all of this expression throughout the, the heart. It was really impressive actually. Again, a surprise. We, you would think you might just get expression along the needle track, but no, it, it, and I think this is something special with muscle. It's contractile, it moved the, the delivery uh, substrate around. Many cells got transfected. And then we applied this uh, cardiac infarction model. Uh, and these are blood vessels. You're looking at these orange lines. And when we introduced a modified mRNA for VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, it stimulates blood vessel formation. Typically what happens when you get a heart attack, you uh, don't get good revascularization of the cardiac tissue. Uh, and so that leads to scarring of the heart. So you have a poor recovery from infarction. So we found that we could have a much better uh, uh, recovery when we injected the modified mRNA for VEGF into an infarction model. And actually AstraZeneca took this program into the clinic. So this is in clinical development. This is in uh, soon approaching phase three trials. But there's a step first. Uh, they didn't take it directly from us. Uh, we transferred it to Moderna and uh, Moderna made a partnership with AstraZeneca. So these were the properties of mRNA, and this is what I went out to raise money from investors to try to start Moderna. So the properties of mRNA, it's non-toxic, naturally occurring nucleosides, it's non-immunogenic, that's why it works, uh, it's dose titratable, it's temporal control, if you wanted short expression, you put in one dose, if you want long expression, you put multiple doses, and really the key thing is versatility. If you've got an open reading frame, you can make an mRNA out of it. So literally any protein is, is possible. I imagine that the timeline for drug de uh, development would be very, very fast. I think we've just seen that bor borne out <laughs> uh, on the clinical scale where modified mRNA for SARS-CoV-2 was made within 42 days and uh, clinical trials were started. So uh, that was my, uh, uh, I, I foresaw that in 2010. Uh, and that this might disrupt existing ways to express proteins, therape therapeutic proteins. So there's 110 different uh, FDA-approved therapeutic proteins, and they work great, but generally they work in the extracellular space. A, they're very expensive to make, they require huge factories to make, and... Did I do that? <laughs> uh, and, but, you know, you can't get proteins to cross cell membranes. So all of the diseases for which the, the deficit is within the cell are basically excluded from protein therapeutics. mRNA, on the other hand, if you get a cell to express an intracellular protein, guess where that protein will end up? Inside the cell. If you get it to express a secreted protein, it'll be secreted. So it really opens up the spectra of what is treatable. So exciting, exciting technology, and I convinced investors to give me some money, a very small amount of money at the beginning, uh, $2.5 million in 2010. I got some co-founders. I was younger then. Um, uh, Bob Langer, who had started many companies at MIT, and Ken Shen, who was an MD. So I'm a PhD. Bob's an engineer, a delivery expert, and this is why I got him. Uh, and Ken's an MD, so I wanted to put this package together. So we. Uh, raised uh, this small amount of money. That was Moderna's original site uh, in Cambridge, which is just across the river from uh, Boston. And then fast forward 10 years, and although we had originally raised 2.5 million, we ended up raising 2.5 billion. <laughs> That's a big, big jump. Uh, the company went public in uh, 2018. It raised a record amount of money the most ever at the time, $600 million. It's a great stock symbol, mRNA. It wasn't taken, which is cool. Uh, it has a value of many tens of billions of dollars. 2,000 employees, 800 job postings. It's growing incredibly quickly. Uh, here was the really important thing. Even before they had a clinical product, even before SARS-CoV-2 came out, they built a 200,000 square foot GMP manufacturing facility so that they could run clinical trials, so that when SARS-CoV-2 came around, we had a facility to make that drug in. 
So that was really a smart idea, and you could only do that with a lot of money. Obviously, you have to raise a lot of money to build a manufacturing facility. You also have to have a lot of confidence that you're going to make drugs that go to patients. Uh, and there's over 25 different programs in the clinic right now for myriad uh, indications. Lots of viral infections, lots of secreted proteins, lots of proteins for oncology. Um, uh, literally, where there's a human uh, challenge that involves protein, which is almost all, you could think about applying this technology. So in, in all of these different sort of silos, uh, uh, we have programs in all of these. Uh, pipeline looks like this, or part of the pipeline. This is an old slide, but you know, phase one, two, three, and then we skip ahead here, and of course the one that makes it into patients first, even though it started much later than others, but this accelerated pace, thank you, SARS-CoV-2 and uh, COVID-19 pandemic, but it really uh, pushed the technology quickly through to patients because it was the right technology at the time. And I show you a little bit of data here. I'm sure many of you have seen this um, from the, uh, a paper that was published in late uh, 20, uh, 2020, the first year that the pan pandemic first uh, came out. So on the y-axis is the event rate. So in other words, uh, COVID-19 positive. And on the x-axis is time. And so you can see those two arrows. The first arrow, you get your first dose of mRNA uh, vaccine against uh, SARS-CoV-2. The second arrow is your second dose. And then there's two groups of patients here, those that got the placebo, which are in gray, and those that got the uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. And I think you can appreciate that those that didn't get the vaccine continued to get COVID-19, and that those that got the vaccine didn't. Um, so that was very, very exciting data. It had 94% efficacy at stopping uh, uh, infection, and it had 100% uh, uh, success at severe infection and, and death. So very exciting. I'm going to tell you a different story now. Uh, and we could talk about all these stories, but I wanted to jam a few in there. And I know I'm taking my time, so please bear with me. So towards approving, uh, improving the first stem cell uh, therapy, and Alessandra Beefy knows a lot about this here, sitting uh, in the front row there. So um, bone marrow transplants are used around the world to save people from a number of different diseases, hematologic malignancies. This is just a sort of a chart of the globe showing the numbers of transplants done in different countries each year. There's about 50 to 60,000 bone marrow transplants done per year. And they're done for a myriad of different reasons, leukemia, lymphoma, myeloma, bone marrow failure syndromes, sickle cell, beta thal on rare occasion, and other, other diseases. But it's, it's actually a pretty high-risk procedure, as bespoken by these numbers. So the one-year survival rate, and these are old numbers, but the one-year HLA uh, uh, with a matched donor, your sibling, uh, one-year survival rate is only 70%, and for unrelated donors, it's only 55%. So this is really a last-chance therapy. When you um, are... You, if there's any other way to treat you for your disease, you're treated with that. And if you fail all those, then you get transplant. Uh, and what kills patients? Well, typically, if, if you're being treated for a cancer, it's relapse. That kills a lot of patients. But opportunistic infection and graft-versus-host disease kills. Uh, and, and certainly, if it doesn't kill you, if you're getting cells from somebody else, you almost certainly suffer for some degree of graft-versus-host disease. I love these pictures. So on the, on the upper right, uh, this picture of the lady uh, in the middle, Nancy McLean, she was the oldest surviving transplant patient, uh, and that's her transplantation doctor on the left, so uh, Robert Kyle, and this was 52 years after she was transplanted for a bone marrow failure syndrome. But actually, there's another person that's probably even more important in this picture, and they, the photographer only got half of that person. But look at the person on the right. Who do you think, who does she look like? Well, she looks like the lady in the middle. It's because it's her identical twin. 
because that was her donor. And you could only, at the time, in the early days of bone marrow transplant, you could only transplant really successfully from identical twins or very, very closely uh, uh, matched donors. And that's before we knew about HLA typing. Luckily, we learned about a lot about HLA typing, so that leads us to the picture on the bottom, where this young woman on the left, uh, Jocelyn Miller, had very, very severe uh, sickle cell disease, and her donor is with her, a German woman, Petra Poker, so she had a very good HLA match. She gave bone marrow and saved this young woman uh, on the left. So uh, it's come a long way, bone marrow transplant, but there's still a lot of challenge. And, you know, in the pie chart at the bottom, you know, you're dying, for, you know, you still die post-transplant. A lot of patients do primary disease, graft versus host disease, these myriad different, uh, different reasons, mucositis, severe infection. So I was thinking about this, uh, and I had a lot of people in my lab working on uh, blood-forming stem cell biology because I have some background in that. And so the process of how transplant works is you have a donor on the upper left, they give bone marrow, you can process that bone marrow in some way, shape, or form, you can preserve it, and then you come down to the bottom right, and you have to precondition the patient before you give them the, the, uh, the transplant. And that's for two reasons. Typically, it's to kill their cancer, so you give them a big full body radiation or chemotherapy, but also it's to make room uh, in the bone marrow for the new cells, the transplanted cells, to have space to take up residence in the host, uh, and then you reinfuse those cells. So we imagined that we might be able to intervene to make this life-saving medicine uh, better if we could. There's certain patients that don't, or donors that don't mobilize well. The one thing that's true is the more stem cells trans transplanted, the better. So maybe we could expand the cells as well. But I think the big one is the conditioning. You know, when you give full body uh, chemo and irradiation, it's non-specific. You're giving it to the entire body. And you may not need to do that. You may need to just clear out the blood, uh, the blood stem cell compartment to allow for a transplant to occur. So we worked on that, it, all of these things. And we had success in all of them, actually we and colleagues. And I'll just show you a tiny bit of data here. So this is a mouse transplant on the right. So uh, the more transplanted you are is the y-axis. The higher you up, the, the better, more successful the transplant was. So typically, if you give a transplant into a, a mouse and you don't precondition it, and in mouse, we do a very primitive conditioning. We irradiate the mouse. We put it into an irradiator. We irradiate the mouse. And you can transplant and get good, a good transplant. But if you don't irradiate, you get that gray line. You get basically no, you put donor cells in and you get no uh, transplant. What we did with the green line was not irradiation. We took an antibody that was specific to a cell surface receptor expressed on stem and progenitor cells, so it would have an affinity to find stem cells uh, in the mouse, and we hooked up that antibody to a toxic agent. And this antibody, when it interacts with its receptor, is internalized. It would take that toxic molecule in with it, and it would kill the stem cells. Killing the stem cells specifically to allow us to transplant new stem cells into the animal. So instead of getting full body, non-specific irradiation, now we're having a, a, a technique where we specifically target the stem cell compartment, eliminate those, and then we can go in and you get a very successful transplant in that green line. So, and this was published in several papers, and then after many years of work, we founded another company uh, called Magenta Therapeutics. Uh, um, uh, I, along with my colleague David Scadden at Harvard, this was the original team, uh, and this is what they're, this is an old slide, but multiple different programs, uh, uh, and the one I'm most excited by is in the blue here, the conditioning program, because I think this is the one that's going to really open up transplant to a lot of uh, patients. Can you imagine if you could go in for a relatively minor procedure where you take an, a, a dose of antibody, it clears out your stem cell compartment, and then you get your transplant, no radiation, no chemo. One last story. I'll take a little drink of water, drying out up here. Uh, so this is a story about CRISPR-Cas9. 
And uh, I'm sure the biologists in the room and those that in the lab, and I'm not sure how many of you fall into that category, but are working with CRISPR-Cas9 because it's uh, really powerful. Uh, but it starts again it, with a funny, uh, funny, at least our entree from a, a, an unusual uh, a spot. And it's actually from this fellow here who's uh, Timothy Brown, also known as the Berlin patient. So Timothy Brown was twice unlucky and once very lucky. So he was unlucky in that he was HIV positive. That's not very lucky. Uh, but then he was really unlucky in that he developed uh, leukemia. And, but he got lucky, finally, uh, because a lot of research had been done since HIV first emerged in the 1980s. And um, it was discovered that there's certain populations of people that are hyper uh, resistant to HIV infection. And it turns out that these people had a small deletion, naturally occurring deletion, in a gene called CCR5. So they have this little delta 32 uh, uh, mutation which was, would normally be a mutation, but it provided them a great advantage because CCR5 is the co-receptor for HIV-1 strains of HIV. That's how HIV gets into the cell. And by virtue of the fact that these people had a small mutation in CCR5, HIV couldn't latch onto the cells, couldn't get into the cells, so these people were hyper-resistant to HIV. So it's a, it's a great natural experiment. We had people out there, and they're most, mostly northern European descent. Uh, but luckily for Timothy Brown, this had been known by the time he was diagnosed with leukemia. So his transplant docs found a donor that happened to be HLA matched and CCR, or CCR5 Delta 32 uh, mutation. So he got transplanted, as we were just talking about transplantation, with cells from a donor that had this naturally occurring mutation, and he became the first person on planet Earth to be cured of HIV. So he was also cured of his AML, his leukemia, and that actually was the thing that was gonna kill him fast. So he was cured of that, but he also became uh, cured of, of HIV as well. And there's been a second patient since. So I always knew this story and I was inspired by this story. So when CRISPR came out, uh, and CRISPR came out, I'm terrible with the passage of time, but I think it was 2013, the original papers from uh, Charpentier and Doudna and George Church and Fanjang, we started working on it immediately because I said, well, let's target CCR5, let's make a mutation, a Delta 32 mutation in human blood forming stem cells that we might imagine transplanting back into patients a la the Berlin patient. So we um, found that we could make, so here we, I'm not gonna explain how CRISPR-Cas9 works because I think many of you know, but it's a, it's a protein that cuts DNA, it's guided to its cut site by a guide RNA, which is complementary to DNA. Uh, and so we used two guides because we were trying to make a deletion. We wanted to have two cuts and we found guides that were very effective. We used it on multiple different human donors, on lots of different human clones. And we found actually, this was in the early days of CRISPR-Cas9 that we could do this with very high efficiency, get both alleles on the right knocked out at 20% efficiency. That was very, very high. Um, when we put this into human blood forming stem cells and then transplanted those stem cells into immune compromised mice. We found that we could still get donor engraftment. So the human chimerism is in those red boxes. It's all mouse cells on the, uh, on the left, but the human cells are in the red box. Uh, and then when we look at those human cells, we have B cells, we have T cells, we have myeloid cells. And when we look at the molecular level of those cells, they have this delta allele that we had introduced. So a CRISPR-Cas9 manipulated human stem cell could still transplant. It's not surprising, but it needed to be demonstrated and contribute to blood formation in a transplant donor. So um, our idea was this. You know, you would take an HIV patient, possibly an HIV AML patient. You could take out their stem cells, HSCs, hematopoietic stem cells. That's what that stands for. That would be CCR positive. You could introduce CRISPR-Cas9, make this delta allele, 
and then transplant those back into the patient, Ella Timothy Brown. Uh, and of course, if you could condition the patient with a magenta-inspired uh, targeted conditioning method, wouldn't that be nice as well? Oh, and by the way, maybe you could express CRISPR-Cas9 with modified mRNA, which is, by the way, what all the, all the CRISPR companies are doing. So funnily, these three stories tie into this picture here. Uh, and we also got the cover of step, uh, cell stem cell at the time. It was, a, I, again, uh, commissioned an artist because we had shown that the targeting that we did was very, very, very precise. We were not getting off targeting because we made good guides and we could really get it bullseye right on the stem cell at very high efficiency. Kind of a cool cover. And that was published in 2014 in uh, November 6th. And then on November 18th, we announced the formation of Intellia Therapeutics, which is a therapeutic CRISPR-Cas9, uh, with some uh, co-founders. I think you all recognize Jennifer Doudna in the upper right. He, she won the Nobel Prize for her discoveries in CRISPR-Cas9. Rudolf Barangu, uh, Luciana Marafini, Eric Sondheimer. These are all basic, basic CRISPR biologists, and I'm the sort of oddball there because I'm not a hardcore CRISPR biologist. Uh, anyhow, this is what the, and again, this slide is old, but uh, 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 Intellia has taken uh, CRISPR into patients in two strategies. Take the cells out, CRISPR them, put them back in. That's on the bottom. But the really exciting one is in vivo. So they've put a modified mRNA, so nice, uh, expressing Cas9, with a guide uh, into a lipid nanoparticle, and then they deliver it to the patient. It goes to the liver, and, and they've found that uh, they can, in patients, get very effective uh, editing in the liver very safely. So that's very exciting. So um, I'm going to stop there. Uh, there's so many people that have been involved in the work. I, my, uh, when I ran my lab at Harvard, this was uh, some of the people in my lab uh, during one period. Uh, they didn't let me do experiments because I was dangerous uh, to do experiments. I'd lost all those skills. So these are the people that actually do the experiments, uh, people that pass through the lab, various collaborators and funding sources. Uh, and I'll stop there and uh, take questions if you have them. So thank you. I could listen for hours, but we can't. So I'll ask you a couple of questions and then open it up to the audience. I hope that you guys are comfortable enough to ask questions. You can ask them in Italian, I can translate, whatever. You feel comfortable, but I strongly, strongly encourage you to do so. So actually, one thing. As you, I mean, is it there any question that nobody has ever asked? and you would like to answer to? Uh, so the question was, you know, is there still some out science, <laughs> outstanding science that I'd like to do? Well, mm. I think that's that? what you've asked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's lots of, I mean, there's so many unknowns. We're, we're, um, I describe uh, various fields of science like this, so again, I'm, I'm all about X's and Y axes. <laughs> <laughs> it's my thing. So, you know, the um, y-axis here is the amount of studies being done, and the x-axis is time. So different fields of uh, science have gone from their inception where they're low on the y-axis, and then they, there are more and more studies, more and more people, more and more resource, and maybe eventually they plateau. Where we are with understanding biology, because biology is a very complex you know, we've only had molecular, modern molecular biology since the 1980s. And modern molecular biology allows us to answer a lot of questions. And we've only had cell therapy over the past couple of days, uh, decades and st uh, stem cell-based therapies. So I would say that we're at, at the bottom, you know, just barely taking off, barely taking off. So I encourage young scientists to think that you are about to get on this incredible rise 
where there's going to be so much resource and so much, so many questions that we can answer because we have the tools to answer them. So I'm always drawing these graphs with my hands. And by the way, I've, <laughs> I've given so many seminars over the past couple of years on Zoom, yeah. and I'm sitting there in my Zoom room, and I'm going with my hands for graphs. I'm sorry, I have a graph. <laughs> but, uh, but the idea, well, I haven't been using this. Sorry, it's okay. <laughs> the idea is that uh, we're at the early days of uh, understanding biology, and so there's I'm going to say tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of questions that are unanswerable. So for me personally, I know you asked me, again, I'm not going to do any experiments because I'm dangerous, <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm, I'm passionate about something right now that um, I, I would love to tell you about. So um, it's snake bite and snake envenomation. So here's some numbers that you may not know. So uh, each year around the globe, 125,000 people are killed by venomous snakes. And 450,000 are maimed. And when I say maimed, that's loss of limb, that's loss of legs, that's loss of arms. And of course, the people that are affected by snake bite are the most marginalized. There are farmers in sub-Saharan Africa, India, Asia, and so pharma is not paying attention to that problem because those people don't have really great healthcare systems that are going to pay a lot of money to develop drugs. Luckily, there is a therapy that's been in existence for about 100 years. It's Antisera. You may have heard of Antisera. The problem with Antisera is that it's a snake bite specific. So if you get bitten by a rattlesnake and you get an Antisera for a cobra, that's not going to help you. So uh, I've been working with a company on a universal snake bite antidote. That's actually a small molecule. It inhibits one of the key nasty toxic enzymes in snake venom. It's a very effective small molecule. It was developed by Eli Lilly for a different indication. It's been in humans, thousands of patients. We know it's safe. Uh, and it cross-reacts with the enzymes called phospholipase 2. Uh, it's a very effective phospholipase 2 inhibitor, and we've tested it on over 40 different uh, venomous snakes. Uh, you can inject a pig with venom from a snake. The pig will die. It will lay down. It will stop moving. It will stop breathing. It will die. You give them this drug. Half an hour later, that pig is up running around. So uh, we're in clinical trials right now with a company that I didn't found, but I've been a big supporter of. I'm on their scientific advisory board and on their board. Uh, we're in clinical trials in America and India right now for snake bite, and we hope to have uh, pivotal results by the end of the year. But this is something I'm very excited by because this inhibitor, it's a pill. So you could imagine having that in every village. It doesn't require cold chain. So there's no refrigerators are necessary. You just get a bottle of pills. You know, some child gets bitten by a snake. They go to the central place in the village. They take a pill. They still have to go to the hospital, but they'll get to the hospital alive. Typically now, most snake bite patients die before they reach the hospital. Snake venom is very effective. Think about it, a legless, armless, predator yeah. needs something really good, venom. Yep, that's impressive. I told you what you need to work on next. Ticks. What's that? Ticks. Oh, it's ticks, next. yeah. After ticks snakes next. comes ticks. Ticks next. Thanks. Ticks are awful. Thanks. Yeah. So another question, and then I'll open it up to the audience. So time is key in everything, right, that you discussed. Like even now, we're just scratching the surface. But for example, uh, when SARS-CoV-2, right, hit, and uh, so you mentioned that from sequencing to having something to start trials, the vaccine, it was what, like four weeks? 42 days. Yeah, a month. And that's crazy, but the thing is that, so a lot of people, I think, were puzzled by how, why so fast? But the thing is that they do not know that it was like 15 years of research before that. And now we, we have the power to do so, right? Yeah, yeah, so you're talking a little bit about the transparency of drug development. You know, we've, we developed this drug, um, you know, for SARS-CoV-2 within a year. You may have, you may recall from the early days of the pandemic, they'd get experts on and they'd say, well, we're going to have a vaccine in three or four years at, at the earliest. 
And I kept thinking, hmm, they don't know mRNA, do they? Because it's really fast. Uh, and um, so, indeed, SARS-CoV-2 genome was published by the Shanghai Consortia in January. 42 days later, Moderna shipped clinical-grade SARS-CoV-2 vaccine to the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, to begin clinical trial. Part of the reason they, they could do that is because they had built this manufacturing facility that I told you about, which was really wise, and they had the capability. And the reason that the NIH was so interested is because they had already run multiple Moderna trials. They had seen all the data. They had seen how safe it was. They had seen how efficacious it was. So the NIH was like, yes, please get us something quickly. 42 days is extraordinary. Remember, three, four, five years to 42 days. That's impressive. But then the second part of it was that um, the pandemic, as you all know, and I see you're still in masks, I really feel sorry for <laughs> Doesn't it suck to be in masks? Uh, but um, the clinical trial process is normally a very long process because you do your, and again, here I'm going to draw some graphs with my hand. So typically you do phase one and you gather all your data from phase one, you analyze your safety, you analyze your efficacy with some interim period, and then you begin your phase two. And then you get all your data in and then you analyze your data, and then you begin phase three. Well, what they did with uh, SARS-CoV-2 was they started phase one, and here I need both hands. They started <laughs> phase one, and as soon as they collected six weeks of safety data, they started phase two. So phase one was not complete. Six weeks of safety data started phase three. Clinical trials are never done like this, but they were done like that, and it, it because of the urgency of the challenge that we were facing. Also, I will say, and I was not a big, I shouldn't say this, I'm not going to just yeah. zip. The one good thing that the U.S. government did at the time, I'll rephrase it, uh, was Operation Warp Speed. Yeah. Uh, and so that actually gave lots of money to these companies, Moderna in particular, to be able to run these at-risk because they were at risk. Normally, a company would never start a phase two before they got their phase one results, because if they got bad results in phase one, they'd be flushing all that money down the toilet. It'd be an incredible waste of money. So you want to wait for your data. You want to know that your phase one was safe and efficacious. You want to know that your phase two is safe and efficacious. But not in this case. It was the government's money, and it was a wise decision for the government to put that money in there. But that is really what accelerated uh, that we could do phase one, two, and three within a year's time, combine it with this unbelievable technology that you could have clinic-grade material made in a few weeks, which is extraordinary. Yeah. Synthesizing nucleic acid is easy. <laughs> For those that have ever synthesized nucleic acid, very easy. Yeah. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, the public yeah. didn't see these hands. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so they, they uh, were, you know, always looking for a conspiracy, and they were thinking, well, how could it be so fast? They must have skipped steps. You know, this couldn't possibly be safe and efficacious. Well, the fact of the matter is, it was a more transparent process than ever before. So the meetings to discuss the data with the FDA were live streamed. So any human on planet Earth could have watched all the discussions of all the data for the clinical trials and the safety. You don't normally live stream those data, but in the, uh, in the uh, interests of transparency, these very critical meetings were live streamed around the planet, again, making it a more transparent process than normal. So it's actually not less transparent, it's more transparent the development of these drugs, and it's a great scientific achievement, obviously. Uh, obviously. Now, you know, billions of people vaccinated, and we're so you're soon going to be maskless because we're getting very near the end. Nice. Let's not discount that more variants will come because mm -hmm. it's an amazing organism, <laughs> this, this, you know, SARS-CoV-2. Its uh, mutagenic ability is really impressive. It's going to be with us forever. Uh, we're going to have it every year. We're going to get boosted every year. Uh, that's certain. But uh, but uh, we we will uh, persevere. We'll get out of this. Those are the kind of weapons that we like.
we like to fight with those weapons, sure. right? And any questions? Don't be afraid. Please don't be shy. Go on. Oh, we have one there, over there. And actually, I mean, students don't let anybody do any work in the lab. Yeah. Don't worry. Like, if they see me around, they're like, what are you doing? You're not going to touch anything. Yeah, good. So, yeah. <laughs> so, hello. Hello. Thank you for your speech. It was wonderful to hear you. Um, can you so, pull your mask down just yes, to talk so I can course. hear you? Yes. Thank you. So, you just showed us, uh, like, your journey with a lot of, with a lot of success and uh, discoveries, beautiful discoveries. But as a PhD student, as myself, I'm teaching students, did you face any obstacles and difficulties? How did you manage them? So do you have any advice to give to young researchers here in this room? Thank you. Yeah. Um, fortunately for me, I've led a charmed life, so, and, uh, so I haven't actually had that many obstacles. But, but the one, one thing that is true, though, and it's true of, of all of science, uh, and all of scientists, you better be used to failure because by and large, when we do an experiment, uh, we often don't get to answer the question that we're asking for whatever reason, be it technical or our hypothesis was wrong or some noise in the system doesn't allow us to answer the system. So A, you have to be okay with failure. Not only that, but I would argue that you have to, failure is one of the most uh, educational things that you could possibly have happen to you. Success is nice, of course. It's nice to, to learn something that is effective, but it's also equally important to know what doesn't work. Because if you learn what doesn't work, you can, you can um, have a way, you can try to think of a way around. So I describe it as a, a, um, <laughs> a solid uh, concrete wall. Often in science, we hit this concrete wall, and you think, how the heck am I going to get through that concrete wall? Well, I, will, I would argue that there's not a concrete wall that we can't chew through. So I was always telling my students and postdocs, you know, chew through that wall. Um, because, you know, you can freely, you can get through that wall. And, and I'll, I gave you an example. We tried to use mRNA. We killed all the cells in the dip. I know that unmodified mRNA is not going to work. So it led us to the literature. It led us to these discoveries, which, by the way, had been published and forgotten. You know, when Carrico and Weisman, I've talked to them, they're, they're friends, uh, when they made their discovery, they thought it was going to be the biggest thing since sliced bread, and it just nobody paid any attention to it, and, and uh, it was basically dead. They tried to start a company, an mRNA therapeutics company. They raised zero dollars. They had no success. It ended. But, you know, we came along a couple of years later, and thank goodness for their research, because it was enabling, and as I said, they will win the Nobel Prize for that, I guarantee it. Um, and this is how science is done. We build off the dis discoveries of others. <laughs> Any scientist who thinks, oh, it started with me and it's all for me, don't listen to that person. Of course, it, you always build on the shoulders and build on the works of others. So I think I'm getting a little bit tangential here, but my point is failure is really important. Don't be discouraged. Of course it's discouraging, but don't, dis, dis, don't be discouraged. Find out what you can learn from that failure. There's learnings in failure, and you will have so many failures in science. It's just the nature of the beast. Learn from it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Derek. It was, uh, it was impressive, of course, beautiful. And uh, getting to the question of the PhD student, uh, I always tell our students that you have low risk science and high risk science. And unfortunately, a lot of effort goes into low risk science. You publish, you, you move on, contribution is and reward, I think, is minimal. Well, what you show is that if you ask daring questions, be brave, and then, of course, you take risks. But uh, it really uh, gives you intellectual success and, and what you do has, uh, has relevance. I want to ask you something uh, referring to the use of uh, 
the new pharmacology. I think we share the idea that uh, uh, the success of the mRNA vaccine has really proved to everybody that pharmacology will go that way. I mean, that uh, as you pointed out in your beautiful slide, every target is allowed now because mRNA makes every single protein and, uh, and you can uh, introduce CRISP, uh, CRISPR-Cas and so on. So that's really something that can be the tool to make thousands of drugs, thousands of targets, which is the principle of individual medicine, of you know, personalized medicine. Now, the example that you showed that clearly was driven by urgency, which is phase one, phase two, uh, only in this very short time frame. Uh, can it be, not replicated, but in some ways, can we imagine that the classical uh, bottleneck, you know, you, a huge amount of work, huge amount of economical effort to produce very few drugs now can really change. And you can imagine that a single platform, because I mean, our nucleic acids are nucleic acids, and, and it will allow us to, to have hundreds of biotechs, of companies that will really produce all the drugs that we need. Yeah, it's a great question. So as you know or can imagine, uh, there's uh, variant specific uh, vaccines for Moderna's got beta, delta, and Omicron in the clinic. They're going through phase one, phase two, phase three. And then I would ask, is it really necessary? Because we know that the platform is, is safe. And by the way, when we get our flu vaccine every year, which I hope everybody takes their flu vaccine, there are some safety studies done, but there's not a phase one, two, and three, because that would be stupid. By the time you finished your phase one, two, and three, you'd be three years later, and it would be a new flu. So I think there'll come a time, at least with the mRNA, that we start to get, I mean, we've had a great uh, start, because it's been in several billion people right now. That's a pretty good experiment for safety. <laughs> That's a good experiment for safety. Billions of people, safe and efficacious. But it's early, it's new, right? And there's still some people, actually there are many people on the planet that don't know that there's 300,000 copies of mRNA in every cell, cell of your body. So everybody sitting out there, I'll just use my, myself as an example, trillions of copies of mRNA in me right now modified mRNA, by the way, uh, doing my biology. So education, but also these safety studies and these efficacy studies um, will accelerate that. And maybe we don't have to do the phase one, two, and three. We do a small safety study. So I think that's, that will happen with mRNA vaccines. When we get into other therapeutics, though, and, you know, let's face it, safety studies and clinical trials are important. You know, the, 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 the classical um, sort of, uh, the, 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 the category of drugs for which their most approved drugs are small molecules. So small molecules are little molecules that, that we introduce, little chemicals that inhibit an enzyme, a protein, or something. Uh, tens of thousands of small molecules have entered the clinic, and thousands have come out the other end. The reason they've done that is because, or there's been this attrition, is because they failed in clinical trial. And they failed for two reasons. Efficacy, they just weren't effective, but safety. And this is really the thing. You know, the, 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 the purpose of clinical trial is to, do, uh, you know, first safety, dosing, then safety, efficacy, then safety, efficacy. So it's safety, safety, safety. And we've needed this. Our, uh, history of making medicines has shown us that that's really important because there are so many drugs that have entered at me in my hands again, entered at this uh, side at phase one and not made it to clinical approval because of safety and efficacy. So um, I certainly wouldn't advocate for you know um, not doing clinical trials because some people would say, well, look, we made a medicine in a year. Why can't we? And certainly, if you have a loved one who's sick, you know, and probably all of us have a loved one who's sick or have known a loved one that's sick. You're just thinking, we need a medicine for our loved one. But, oh, and there's something in clinical development, but it's gonna be several years 
till it's proven safe, the, safe and effective and that my loved one can get it, my loved one's going to be dead by then. So there's a conundrum here because we need these clinical trials. They do take time. Um, can we streamline it? Sure. Of course we can. I mean, part of it, as I said, and this is a, this is a good example, the reason that Moderna did over, and Pfizer, Pfizer did the same, Pfizer did it on their own dime. They didn't actually use uh, government money for that, actually. But Moderna was able to do overlapping phase one, phase two, because the cost risk was not theirs. It was money from the government. But most biotech companies and pharma companies, the cost risk is their own. So if they start to put it on top of one another, and you know, you, you want to know a good way to get fired from your job in pharma is you start a phase two before you get your phase one. You find out that your phase one is toxic, and now you've got it in a lot of other people, and uh, you know, you should get fired from your job. So, so we've, we've, got, we've got this challenge. You know, luckily, uh, the mRNA was a it's a natural molecule in our body. It's modified for sure, but it's one of the fundamental uh, uh, molecules of life. It was really amenable, and it was a timing of science and a confluence of having these previous studies done at the NIH that really showed safety and efficacy that allowed us to think, okay, let's stagger, let's stagger these trials to, to get it really, and the urgency of, of, of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So that is a one in a million chance that all of these things came together at exact, I mean, you can't believe how lucky we are that all of these things came at the same time to allow for this expedience of, uh, of uh, vaccine delivery. That won't happen all the time. I would argue though, anybody who's got a sick loved one, you feel that urgency as well. Of course you feel that urgency. So we have to streamline. Maybe we take the risk away from the investors and the, um, the companies and move it to the government. That's very, that now you're talking lots of taxation to pay for that. I mean, who pays? It's very expensive, so it's a tough one. I appreciate the thought though. Okay. I think, are there Please don't be shy. Here's a question. Oh, here's another one. Posso in italiano? Sì. Io mi chiamo Vincenzo Imperiale, non sono un biologo, studio imprenditoria e innovazione e professore e anche un imprenditore seriale. Io vorrei, numero uno, ringraziarlo per i suoi studi, per le sue innovazioni. Io ho fatto Moderna e basato sulla sua tecnologia. Vorrei chiedere due cose. Se al professore imprenditore, se lei ha rimorsi, se farebbe tutto nello stesso modo o se cambierebbe qualcosa, parlava di fallimenti, i come successi li conosciamo, ma il suo più grande fallimento imprenditoriale? Grazie. Oh, sir. Go ahead. No, I'm kidding. So... <laughs> If I were you, I would take the ravioli. <laughs> <laughs> translation, so, please. Translation. Desp despite the fact my name is Rossi, I don't speak Italian. But you will, because you're coming back, so you'll learn Italian, that's okay. So, the question is more on your entrepreneurial activities. So... Two questions. Uh, you talked about failures. So what do you believe is your major failure in your entrepreneurial career? And the other one is that if you were given the chance to go back in time, we were talking about it, would you do it exactly like you did? Would you do all over everything again, same way? So I keep getting asked about failure and <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like I, I talk to my, uh, my lawyers about family planning and they're always like, okay, Derek dies. They're always trying to kill me. So we need to get insurance in case Derek dies. They're always trying to kill me. Uh, so um, I, I think one thing that I would do, so when, you, when you're a student, you learn to be a good student. It doesn't train you to be a good professor. You, you enter, you get your professorship, and it's a whole new skill set. So you have to learn to be a professor, and some learn faster than others, and some learn better than others, but you're not trained for it. Then, me, personally, I started a biotech company. I had zero skills. 
for that. I, I really had no skills for that. Um, so I made some mistakes that I would change because what I, I'm a scientist, so I like to talk about science. I'm a very trusting person, but unfortunately you're dealing with biotech people that are uh, greed motivated, <laughs> if I may say, <laughs> and money motivated. Um, and so I um, gave, I, not intentionally, but I um, unwillingly gave up some amount of power. And that's one thing that I would change. And now, since I've, I've now learned how to do biotech, um, I know how to keep power. You know, you keep uh, board seats, you make sure you put people that you know and trust on the board, um, you maintain enough of the equity that you have a significant voice. So it's a bit of a weird story, but that, that is one thing that I've learned because I lost some amount of power and control. And actually, I was quite upset about it early because, you know, in the early days of Moderna, it was raise money, 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 money. And I kept not hearing the word that I wanted to hear, which was patience, patience, patience. You know, we're making medicine for people, people, people. And I kept hearing money, 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 money. And so that bothered me. Um, so anyhow, it's something that I've learned. I've done uh, five biotechs since, and I work with a lot of others, and control is important. It sounds funny, but it, it is actually important because, you know, it sets agenda, and it sets direction, and it sets focus. And so that's one thing that I've learned. And then the second question was, Oh, back in time, the time capsule. Um, no, I wouldn't change anything, except for maybe that. Um, yeah, no, I, like I said, I, I, I feel lucky and blessed to have, uh, um, you know, um, taken the very circuitous path, because I took a very strange path to, you know, I got my PhD very late in life. I was in PhD programs all over the planet not getting my PhD. Uh, but um, I wouldn't change that because I learned so much about this and that and the other in life and had a lot of fun on the way, by the way. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, 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 I hope we can all live, live our lives that we don't look back and say, damn it, I wish I had done something differently. You know, I don't want to live life that way. I want to I wanna live it just like I'm happy with the decisions I've made. Uh, we, hopefully we all share that. I think we have another question, and then we probably need to wrap it up, right? Okay. Oh, first of all, thank you for your brilliant speech. And um, I was wondering, uh, how did you deliver the uh, modified RNA both in the first clinic, uh, for in the first experiments, and uh, now in the clinical trials? Uh, so, did you develop a, a delivery system in parallel or something like that? Yeah. So the question was delivery. And it's a great question. Delivery, delivery, delivery. mRNA is a macromolecule. And when I say macromolecule, it's really big. You know, and of course, depending upon the size of the protein, the bigger the protein, the longer the mRNA, the bigger the molecule. It's unlike small molecules, which we were talking about, most drugs are, they're tiny, tiny by comparison. mRNA is huge. So delivery was always going to be a challenge. Luckily, we didn't have to invent delivery because there had been those that went before us that invented delivery. So when we were introducing the mRNA first to cells in a dish, it would be by any transfection agent, which are basically cationic lipids. Basically, you make a little, I used to call it a little hamburger, a little sandwich. You have your mRNA, you surround it with cationic lipid, which facilitates uptake at the membrane. Um, when we went in vivo, we literally used those same in vitro cationic lipids. Not optimal, but it worked. Actually, this is interesting. When we, we actually did some naked RNA injections into the skeletal muscle, no lipid, and we got expression in the skeletal muscle, which was really impressive. Uh, and I think it's something about uh, muscle biology, you know, contractile muscle and, you know, cell membranes opening up. I'm really speculating here, but this is all I can imagine because we could swim, I call it swim these very large, large, large macromolecules into these cells and get expression without any delivery vehicle.
that's pretty amazing, actually. If you, I mean, that's remarkable. Um, when the clinical trials came around, it's um, lipid nanoparticles, which I'm, I'm sure you've all heard of from the news. So basically, um, fat droplets with the mRNA put inside the fat droplet. It does two things. It facilitates uptake on the cell, and we, when you introduce it, RNA is very labile, means that it's easily degraded. Um, there's a professional class of proteins called RNases, which degrade RNAs. We have this professional class of molecules all over our body. What are they there for? Viruses. <laughs> you know, anything outside the cell that's a nucleic acid, usually we want to chew it up because it's not a good thing unless it's protected in some way. So it was lipid nanoparticles. Luckily, um, there was a really great technology that was developed about 20 years prior to our technology, and it was uh, SI RNAs, small interfering RNAs, which don't, uh, aren't used for expressing proteins, but actually stopping the expression of proteins. They're much, much smaller RNAs, small interfering RNAs. But they had been in uh, clinical development for decades, and it was discovered that lipid nanoparticles were very effective at, at delivering those small interfering RNAs. So the mRNA, you know, Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech, all the, all the nucleic acid um, technologies learned from this and employed these lipid nanoparticles. And you could modify the lipid nanoparticles to make them proprietary or not. Uh, you could imagine putting address tags, I call them address tags, putting loading proteins onto the surface that might take it to one tissue over top of another tissue. Um, it's a big field, and it's an important field, actually, uh, because delivery is key. Like I said, gigantic molecule must get inside the cell to be effective, because it has to go to the ribosome to make a protein. So it must get inside the cell. So delivery, uh, we're, we've, luckily we had lipid nanoparticles, but I think there's going to be a lot of delivery science over the next uh, number of years that, uh, that, that helps us. Good question. Great. So thank you all for the attention, for engaging in questions, and let's thank our speaker again.